So good afternoon, good morning to everyone. My name is Suda David Wilk. And on behalf of the Berlin office for the German Marshall Fund of the United States, I'd like to welcome you to our sixth Transatlantic Tuesday. And thank you for tuning in uh, to strengthen transatlantic relations in this very unprecedented, unprecedented time. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our um, supporters for our programming, our, namely our business alliance comprising of members like Bayer, Deloitte, Google, and Pfizer. Um, and before I hand over the mic to our moderator today, uh, Rachel Tausenfreund, I just want to walk everybody through a few housekeeping rules. We will be recording today's session. And as always, we'll start off with the moderated uh, conversation, but certainly think about the questions or comments you'd like to make. You could use the raise your hand function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. That's the um, icon that we're going to use to collect questions and they'll queue up in order. Rachel will call on you and please introduce yourself briefly. And again, keep in mind that this session will be recorded. Um, if you have technical issues, feel free to use the chat function. So without any further ado, I am going to hand over to my wonderful colleague, Rachel Tausenfriend, who is our editorial director at the German Marshall Fund. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Suda. Thanks, Suda. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, for setting this up. Um, and the rest of the Berlin team, and thank you all um, for being here and attending. Um, I'm going to talk today to Marsha Chatlin. Professor Marsha Chatlin is um, an associate professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She's a scholar of African American life and culture and a strategist, which, strategist, which I think means something like an activist, uh, but we can talk about that later. Um, and her first book was on Southside Girls, and she has a new book uh, just out this year called Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, which examines the intersection of the post-1968 civil rights struggle and the rise of the fast food industry. Marsha, thank you so much for joining us. And um, oh, also important to mention, Marsha is a um, Marshall Memorial Fellow of GMF. So um, she has a kind of relationship with us. Uh, we took her on a tour of Europe um, a few years ago. Um, so I, I'm gonna just jump right in with the first uh, question. Um, so I can't breathe, right? These were among the last words of um, George Floyd and they've been a kind of anthem of the movement against uh, police violence. And, uh, and in fact, Black, Black Lives Matter, which um, has been, in, been on the ground since 2013. Since Trayvon Martin and since Eric Gardner, who um, sort of initiated the, um, this I Can't Breathe slogan when he was killed by a New York police office, uh, police department officer, um, there have been a lot of high profile African-American deaths um, at the hands of the police and there've been a lot of protests. But this time, it does seem different. We've had protests now in um, every single state of the union, that's 50 for the Germans listening. Um, and we've seen many, many international protests. So do you agree that it, does it feel different to you this time as well? And why do you think that is? Is it Corona? Is it Trump? Why is it different? It's a pleasure being here um, with everyone and to be able to connect virtually, if not uh, in person. Uh, I really enjoyed my GMF experience and I'm really glad that we're able to talk about this um, with audiences on both sides of the Atlantic. So here are the things that I think um, are fundamentally different in this particular moment. Um, one is coronavirus, so a global pandemic has been able to expose the failures in the US of not only leadership in terms of the presidency, but also um, for some Americans who are unaware of just the depravity of the inequality in the US. Coronavirus helped blow up um, any, any um, semblance that um, everyone has an opportunity to make it because we see the ways that low-wage workers who don't have access to quality health care are having to serve right populations that have the privilege of staying at home and being protected so we have a pandemic that has exposed inequality we are in the middle of um, quite possibly the worst presidency in american history and we also had a full seven years of a kind of civic education and a political 
consciousness raising that was initiated through the movement of black for black lives in which their relentlessness and their critiques not only of policing but of inequality has finally kind of trickled down in a sense and so the radicalism that um, black lives matter kind of presented in terms of civil rights organizing by having a decentralized structure, by really focusing on the local level, by combining direct action with policy advocacy, with creative arts, with kind of radical imagination, all of those elements are more legible in this context now. And I also think that um, the conversations about um, public memorials, about Confederate statues, all of these things have been turning in this country at the same time. And so I think what is different than the 1960s is that there is a generation of white Americans who have brought been brought to um, a consciousness about these issues through school, through popular culture, who are now willing to kind of also take to the streets. And I also think that because um, the Trump presidency is an exaggeration of the worst impulses of um, America's racism and inequality, that people are more conscientious of not wanting to remain silent in the face of it. Thanks. There's, um, you gave a lot to unpack there. So I'm going to start with uh, just one small point you make, and then I'll, um, and then I want to dig a little bit deeper on the sort of Trump plus, um, you know, seven years, I guess it is now, of movement um, that has been a kind of education. But, um, you know, we're talking to a mainly European audience. And as I said, the other thing sitting in, in Europe, um, it's a broader movement. Um, it's a more diverse movement in the States, um, but it's also made its way to Europe. There have been, um, you know, protests across um, Europe and in fact, even beyond Europe. We had uh, one initially in late March in Berlin, and then we had a huge one um, in early June of 15,000 people, for example, at Alexanderplatz. Do you, how much attention is that getting um, in the States? And, and does it feel, you know, does it feel uplifting? Does it feel also um, bigger because it's more international? Yeah, I think that the, there's some interesting precedent for this. After um, the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, after the killing of Michael Brown, where we saw a global kind of consciousness of people saying that they stand in solidarity with Ferguson and that they, are, they were um, becoming inspired by the movement for Black Lives so that there were people in Palestine talking about... Um, talk about standing in solidarity of Ferguson. Um, we had um, support and mobilization of the Afro-European um, communities, whether it's in you know, Paris, whether it's in Berlin, also raising these issues. And I think that right now people see this at the global solidarity and they're really moved by it. And it's kind of interesting that in terms of these questions about state violence against African-Americans, you know, we've seen that European solidarity and it's in the past. What's interesting is I think this is the first time we've seen all 50 states. So um, when we look at the history of civil rights, um, European um, allyship has been very important um, to struggles in the United States, as well as the kind of global questions that um, this movement surfaces, because I think in the US, what this movement is about is grappling with the legacies of slavery and capitalism. And globally, I think people are um, standing in solidarity because they are grappling with the consequences of, um, of, of colonialism and capitalism. And so side by side, right, people are really connecting. And, you know, there's a, there's a really wonderful history of um, mostly students, European students um, who kept abreast of the news in, in, in the United States in the 1950s and 60s and organized their own kind of sense of solidarity, whether it was at Oxford or um, you know, the Free University. So I think that that is continuing and it's just, it's incredibly uplifting for anyone who's concerned about these issues to see the ways that they re resonate across borders. Thanks, well, yeah, I mean, um... Uplifting, I think, is actually a really good um, term for this movement we're seeing. And you've probably seen this too, but um, there was a recent poll 
Um, this gets also to sort of what are the factors behind it, because we're seeing, you know, a huge shift in numbers as well. So a recent poll came out by um, Monmouth University, and um, it was from early June. And it said, according to this poll, 76% of Americans now, and that includes 71, importantly, percent of white people, um, now call racism and discrimination a big problem in the United States, which is a 26 point percentage point spike since 2015. So, um, you know, as you said, this, this roughly overlaps with the Trump presidency, this huge um, spike. It also, with some lag time, overlaps to, um, to the movement. Um, I mean, this is an unprecedented change in opinion, right? If you look at opinions about, I don't know, abortion, religion in school, military service, these numbers don't change usually that much. Um, so can you feel can you feel the difference on the ground, do you think? And um, where, do you, where do you think it goes from here? Well, I think that, um, I think that people are, in the nation are starting to realize what happens when these forces go unchecked. Um, they yield the presidency of Donald Trump and the excesses of his administration, right? So there was this um, really irritating impulse in the United States after the 2016 <clears throat> election where people, um, believed that the way forward, right, to, to continue with the fantasy of a unified nation was to say, well, people were economically um, anxious and they voted for Trump. And, you know, even though um, his entire campaign was rooted in racism, there are other things, right? This was the kind of fantasy that people were operating under. Well, this administration is unable to do anything. So I think this is now um, a moment of reflection that says, oh, if we um, empower someone whose ent entire, the centrality of his, his move into public life has been racism, that's a problem. Because it's not just a problem for people um, who are not white, and it's not just a problem for people who have been economically and socially marginalized, it's a problem for the entire nation. And so I think what we're, what we're seeing is that people are starting to realize that, those, that that kind of bad, bad faith leadership actually impacts people even in positions of privilege or people who believe that they can be isolated from it. And so I think that what's interesting is to see all the military leaders who are now becoming incredibly, um, who are going against their impulse to criticize uh, the White House, who are being very, very clear. And I think, that, um, I think that our digital landscape has something to do with it. We now have an ability to create an archive, right? Um, you know, as a historian working in with documents from the 19th or 20th century, very few people had the capacity to have an archive because very few people um, were either literate and publishing regularly, like people didn't have papers that were left behind. We all have this incredible digital archive. And I think that there's a real consciousness about being on the wrong side of history in this particular moment. And so I think that there is a shift in recognition of the consequences of institutionalized and structural racism. But I will be most optimistic if I see that translated into a real shift of, in power and a real um, question of, of whether capitalism is, is something that is actually serving um, everyone's needs. Because I think so much of this is tied into um, the economic structures of the, of, the, of the globe, but particularly in the US, because the reason why we have excessive policing is to um, protect private property. And if private property is um, considered more valuable than human life, we will continue to see these instances in which um, people are killed for perhaps a $20 bill that was counterfeit or for selling loose cigarettes on the street or perhaps stealing something of very low value. And so I think the moral reckoning of this moment has yet to happen, but I am incredibly surprised that a struggle that is, you know, a hundred years old is finally becoming legible um, on, a, on a larger level nationally. Thanks. So you mentioned, um, you know, a kind of shift in power um, and whether or not we're gonna see that and how big the shift is gonna be. Well. One thing, um, and, and it's also in the subtitle of this um, event that we have coming up this year is a shift in presidential leadership. Um, and you know whether we're gonna stick with the sort of, um, as you called it, bad faith leadership that we've had um, or, um, or Joe Biden is the alternative. So 
since this um, latest wave of protests start, started, you know, um, Trump, it seems he's, he's trying to play this kind of law and order card. Um, I would say it doesn't seem like it's that successful yet. Joe Biden, um, importantly, hasn't signed on to that at all. Uh, he's been sort of pretty clearly siding with the protests, siding with the grievances of the protests. Um, and he has been attempting, though, to find some kind of unity, right? Um, taking a bit the line, you know what, I was also a naive white guy. I didn't realize things were as bad as they are, but they are. Um, but is he going to go far enough? So first of all, you know, what do you think about his kind of unity approach? Second of all, um, when it comes to this really fundamental challenge of police structures, you know, the capitalist structures, um, you know, can, can Biden capture this momentum or is he too conservative? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of faith in his capacity to actually meet the full challenges of the day. And at the same time, I think that um, he is as good as it gets in terms of a, um, a kind of left, uh, maybe two steps, maybe half a step left of center that can work. Um, the, the one thing that I think is also important um, when we're thinking about the past seven years in the United States and the raising of the consciousness around racial justice issues, the critique of police has been really, really important because I think it wasn't until after Ferguson that most Americans realized there's no federal standards for policing and that um, local level governance of police and varying policies and access to military grade weapons exacerbates a lot of these problems. And I don't think people really understood that as well as the criminalization of the poor through policing structures like issuing tickets or citations for not having your lawn, your grass cut, um, using um, traffic violations to, um, to create bench warrants. And so people then have to pay excessive fees. Like the, the, that relationship between policing and municipal funding was also something that people learned about and became more critical of. So all of this is to say that um, I think what Biden will do is he will carry the flag of the reformist, this idea that you can just reform policing. Um, I'm incredibly skeptical of that perspective because modern policing in the United States um, started with Teddy Roosevelt taking over the New York Police Department over 100 years ago. We have had a lot of attempts to try to diversify police forces, try to do de-escalation de tactics, try to do policing in schools. Um, we had a thing in the U.S. called Officer Friendly to try to make children more comfortable with the police. We've had... Um, We've had more gender diversity in policing. We've had raising consciousness about sexual assault and it has not fundamentally changed. And so all of this is to say that what I do appreciate is that we have a very vocal group of people who've been working on um, defunding and dismantling police and prison abolition for about five decades who have been talking about these ideas that were once considered so radical that they rarely kind of moved into the public consciousness and now their message is kind of landing and people of course are going to um, liberalize that, right? So, so um, someone will say, well, it's time to defund the police and people like Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden will say, no, it's time to reform it. They're never realizing the goals of dismantling and at the same time, by presenting that idea in the public, I think they then are more discerning about what reform can look like. It was only seven years ago that in the United States, we thought that putting body cameras on all police officers would reduce um, brutality. And then we realized that body cameras can be turned off, that the videos can be edited, or that we can have video evidence of um, brutality and nothing happens. And so I think more and more people are understanding that policing is happening on behalf of the public good and that um, as taxpayers, we underwrite these these acts that um, you know, we find unconscionable. So those connections are really good. I think Joe Biden is good at capturing um, an older voter. The older voter who may have voted, um, a brief lesson in American politics and why it doesn't work. Um, there is a, there's another fantasy that has happened in the United States that um, the Democratic Party is strong enough to convert um, Trump voters to Democratic voters. And so they spend a lot of time um, fixating on people who voted for Trump. They do this at the expense of understanding that the reason why 
Barack Obama won the presidency wasn't because the nation was so excited to elect a black president. It's that his presidency was able to inspire new voters to come to the table. And so what we have with Biden is we have an experienced politician who I think can actually get older voters to support him. So he might be able to transition some people from Trump to the Democrats, but I don't know if Biden really is um, the person who's going to inspire new people to come to the electoral process to register to vote and to vote for him for the first time in 2020. Yeah, that is a very big question. Um, so I have a couple more questions. Um, and then I'm going to open it to the floor. So everyone, um, actually, I'm going to, I have one, and then I have one up my sleeve if, if you all are too shy. Um, so I'm going to ask this question and you all be listening to Marsha's answer, but also thinking of, uh, the questions you want to ask. You can use the raise your hand function, uh, and then, uh, you can ask the question yourself. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, so much that I'm very interested um, in what you think about exactly this dilemma that Biden's gonna have. Um, and if he can turn out votes, so I'm from Michigan, and Michigan was one of those states that flipped, um, partly because we had lower turnout in certain areas and partly because we had uh, in, in especially um, the African-American vote. And then we had voters who sort of flipped or new voters who came out for Trump. It's very interesting. Um, so you have these interesting cases, but let's talk, I think, a bit more about um, defunding the police, because I think this is, you know, um, as you say, this was, I mean, this was something you heard, if you were not in sort of activist circles, you barely heard about it um, in the past years. Um, and now all of a sudden it's really sounding, it's really quite mainstream in terms of it's getting voiced everywhere. Um, do you think that the terminology is a problem? Because you have people saying that. You have people saying, like, look, this is a misleading um, phrase. Or do you think it needs to be that strong? Um, and is something like, I believe Biden's campaign called it transformative change they want to see in the police. I mean, can these be the same thing? Or are they really not the same? They aren't the same thing. <laughs> um, and I also think that, um, Activist demand shouldn't be, should never be tailored for what they believe the public is ready for because they're not selling ice cream or, or um, you know, station wagons. Um, they are trying to radically transform the landscape that we're in. And so when people say, well, you know, they shouldn't say dismantle the police, but they mean it, right? Just so whether, um, because it's not, um, it's not a call to say, um, be comfortable with these ideas. It's these are the ideas you can come towards them or away from them. Everyone has a choice. Um, and the idea that because it's such a kind of radical idea that you can't get people to it, um, the fact that it's being discussed is actually successful, right? Because I think what, um, I think, you know, I think the problem in this situation is that um, liberals um, will ultimately capture um, a set of ideas and then turn it into this idea of progressive reform or, um, you know, that that's essentially what happened with the kind of framework of civil rights. Um, whether it's in the 19th century where African Americans who were in the abolition struggle were saying, okay, we want the end of slavery and we want the right to vote and we want the right to live wherever we want. And, um, you know, liberals are saying, no, 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 okay, we can end slavery, but eh, the vote, we're not sure. Um, and so this is a long history. All of this is to say that, yes, you say dismantle when you mean dismantle. And then there will be reformist groups that say, okay, um, reallocate funds from the police. And I think that that is how it's being interpreted. And the fact that people are open to that idea, I think is pretty good. It's not, it's not ideal in terms of if we really want to end policing, um, as a concept, it doesn't do that. But what it does do, it makes people more aware of the costs of this type of behavior. Um, I had the fortune of working on a podcast a few years ago um, that was based on um, the killing of Freddie Gray by the Baltimore Police Department. And in that process, I could not believe um, Freddie Gray was killed while in transport by the police in Baltimore. And I had gone into the archive this was like a thing that happened often. 
in the city where people would be arrested and then put in transport vehicles and then they, you know, they die um, very shortly after. And so if there is a long history of this and there has been no attempt to remediate it, then maybe this isn't a system that we need. And so I think that the critiques of prison abolition, the critiques of um, dismantle the police, they are critiques, but I don't think it necessitates that movement to make any changes. Um, what I do think, um, what I am concerned about is that when we talk about defunding and we talk about where those resources should go, we are so addicted to um, the law and order policing regime in the United States that we can't even use our imaginations to imagine what all of this money could go to. So when people have to say, like social workers or mental health crisis interventionists, um, child abuse specialists, we think about, when we say it this way, I think we start to realize all of the services that we rely on police for, that they are unable, untrained, and unequipped to do, or that even if they are called into these um, situations, they're doing it while armed, which is the strangest thing to me, right? If um, people on this call who have children, um, if I said, okay, well, we use the police to, um, you know, deal with, let's say, kids have a problem, you call the police. It's like saying, well, would you want your babysitter to have a gun with them when they're caring for your children? It doesn't make any sense, but we put police in these um, roles that really require a lot of um, care and compassion and we arm them while they do it. And so I think that this is a great moment um, because um, the abolition movement is, is is having an opportunity to bring more people to a set of ideas that they may have never ever engaged with before. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that's clearly true. Um, there are a lot of new ideas out there. Um, and, and it has been, you know, not from the perspective of the people who've been working on this, you know, with sort of all of their energy and blood and sweat and tears, but um, in this last seven years, I mean, the movement in terms of first acknowledging, you know, for sort of suburban and small town um, white Americans to come to terms with or realize that there really was a sort of problem of racism in the American police to then having discussions about defunding the police. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important um, shift and I guess we'll see where it goes. Why, um, I mean, I think you've, you've sort of hinted at the answer, but there have been all these recent movements of, you know, making the police more diverse, as you said, both in sort of, um, race, ethnic terms, gender diversity. You know, you have in many cities, you know, the, the sergeants or captains of the police force that are um, themselves African-American. Um, and in many cases, then also a mayor who's African-American. So how, how did this kind of political shift not, not translate into um, a shift in policing. And I think, um, you know, to the extent that you know about uh, police unions, that might be an important aspect because it's, it's completely foreign, I think, to most Europeans. Oh, okay. So the two things that I think for the, for the European listeners that um, I think are important to realize is one, um, the US has zero social safety net. Um, you were on your own in the United States. And I think I remember from my um, Marshall trip, um, you know, people asking really curious questions about why is college so expensive? Why do Americans have like no health care? How are you supposed to work and have children at the same time? We have zero social safety net. Like we, we, we have um, charitable services and we have what we call social services, but they aren't funded or supported at a at a level even close to the need that we have. So we have zero social safety net. So everyone is always teetering at the brink of something, whether it's financial collapse, whether it's health collapse. So you have a state that provides very little. And then you have policing, which is then um, designed to protect um, the wealth and resources of of the very, you know, people at the very top. So you already see that kind of antagonism. And then we have police unions, and I'm a supporter of organized labor. 
and police unions also work in the interest of terrifying the public because what they what they do is they say okay you want to dismantle us if something happens don't call us we're not going to come i mean this is a tactic um so you know in labor strikes there's all sorts of ways that you can kind of um you know push against what you want teachers may say okay we're striking we're not going to come and teach school um you know in the you know uh, uh in the aviation industry you might have um slowdowns work slowdowns in factories you might say okay you know half of the pilots aren't going to come in you can't fly anywhere there's there's different ways that labor kind of grinds everything to a halt. The way that the police do it is they manipulate fears that people have. And they say, okay, if you want to defund us, then we're just not going to show up if you have an emergency. And the reason why this is so important is because one, we don't have other non-police facing emergency services and we have no social safety net. So when you, um, if you fall in your home and you need help, the police might come or an ambulance might come and you can't afford to pay the ambulance, right? So there's all of these different ways that I think that we are we are so afraid because we see how precarious we are in the United States. So that's the first part. Um, police unions are incredibly powerful and they're not just powerful in terms of their contract and bargaining power, they're also powerful for in these moments of misconduct. Um, if you saw the head of the New York Police Union you know, he gave a press conference, I think it was last week, where he says, you know, we're, how dare you treat us like thugs and animals? And, you know, they're very sensitive to critique. And the implication then is that if we get critiqued too much, we're not going to make you feel safe. We also have lots of guns in this country. And so you have a population that is always afraid. Everyone is too armed. Everyone is too poor. No one um, has good health coverage. And it's, a, it's impossible for you to pay for childcare and for education. So you start to see how psychologically you are afraid of challenging the police structure because you don't know if you need them or not. And so I think that, um, I can't even remember your question. I started to go down this rabbit hole because it makes me so upset. But all of this is to say that you start to see the complexities um, that it's not just policing. It's about, a, it's about a system that isn't working for people. And you see policing creates this lens of anxiety that then starts to get circulated. And we also have um, an entire uh, media landscape that makes people more and more afraid. You know, Fox News also is another kind of pillar of this current state where then you have a news channel that just makes people feel like if we didn't have, if they don't, if, if you don't have a gun or if you don't have a police force at your disposal, that you'll be overrun and killed by criminals, even though we know violent crime has declined in this country. So all of these factors um, mean that we can't make sane and rational choices about what the future looks like because we're so afraid and we feel so um, at risk. Yeah. And the because we also don't know or we don't agree on what the present looks like, right? This has been part of the problem um, that's luckily changing a bit. But you know, in, in small towns like where I come from, where the police live in the community and they come from the community, you oh, actually have question. Yes. Yeah, you actually have um, you do have community policing, right? Like I, you know, yes. so when I got pulled over for speeding, the cop was like, um, I could give you a ticket or I could talk to your dad, right? Uh, and then these people think this, this is the truth of policing. Yeah, so this is a really good point about what diversity then means in this context. Yeah. So, um, you know, so my most recent book is about this moment after 1968, where you start to see more black mayors being um, elected. Um, you see the diversity that's happening in the police force, um, but the people who are kind of, um, you know, are doing this kind of groundbreaking position they always have to make sure that they can firm up a base that won't um, say that they are only serving one at the expense of the other. So a lot of the early black mayors that I write about, they have to make sure they can still get white voters. They have to cater to the police unions and the police chiefs. They have to make sure that business can come into the community. And so I think that while it is very good that we have tried to diversify representation, I think what has happened is it's about changing the color, but not the fundamental culture. And so, yes, we have a lot of Black police chiefs who are very concerned about police brutality, who are concerned about racism, and in order to keep their jobs, they can't be vigilant about everything that happens in the police force. And this idea of um, 
you know, police officers coming from their from the communities that they serve. This is a huge issue that um, after Ferguson, we learned the number of police officers who were living outside of the communities because of hyper segregation. So we have white officers who are not living in the communities in which they serve. And also the fact that policing is a funding structure for cities. So you can have a very kind police officer in your community, but if he or she is under pressure to write tickets so that the city can have a proper budget, then you start to see the criminalization of activity that exacerbates these tensions. And so it's also about the fact that policing then becomes an extension of the revenue streams that come into these cities that have lost a lot of capital, that have lost a lot of jobs, that don't have a lot of economic investment. Um, thanks a lot. I think that's good. So, you know, you, you've been talking a lot about sort of really fundamental um, kind of core change coming from where we are in the movement now. And it does seem for the first time that that bigger change than something like body cameras and um, a little bit more diversity is, is possible. If you think ahead, um, I mean, what's your kind of realistic, optimistic view on what we could expect, right? If, if things go well, but sort of realistically well, where do you think we are in, in two years? I mean, I just hope we, uh, I'll be very honest with you. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure the U.S. will have an election in November. Mm. I, I just don't know. Um, there's so much malfeasance um, and there's a lot of, I mean, I think part of the problem is that there's so much voter suppression that is also happening in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a White House that has, has just kind of no kind of norms or standards. Um, and uh, who knows, but this is what I do hope for. I think that the first step that we will see is that people in their local communities on the ground will start to ask better questions about how much policing costs. And then they will take a look around because of the pandemic and they will say, well, what are the things our community doesn't have? We don't have enough, um, uh, you know, food insecurity resources. You know, our kids' school wasn't able to transfer into online because we don't have access to Wi-Fi. We don't have computers in our school, so our kids are falling behind academically. I think that what I am most optimistic for is that people will see that there are these bloated police budgets and that there are all of these resources that maybe before the pandemic they didn't realize they needed, that they are now in a position that they need. And I think those two forces together um, will help cultivate leadership and cultivate opportunities on the ground for people um, to just ask better questions about what they need and how those needs are going to be met. Um, I think that this moment will also help cultivate some new talent and it's some new energy in the political parties. I think that um, the fact that Joe Biden was the last man standing in 2016 um, will kind of raise some questions about, okay, how is political leadership being cultivated, um, both for the Democrats and the Republicans, and who's being left out of the conversation. So I think that people will realize how much power that they do have when they work collectively, and I think it'll transform a lot of local communities. Um, in terms of the national uh, picture, I, I, if there's a United States in two years, I'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay, it was... It was a sort of optimistic note until that last <laughs> sentence. <laughs> and then it just went really dark really quickly. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's hope uh, that the election can happen um, regardless of attempts to um, make it less functional and less fair, which are absolutely going on. Um, and that, uh, you know, also things states turn out of this pandemic and are reasonably uh in a reasonably solid way um marcia i'm gonna thank you already and then turn it over to suda um this was so interesting we could have easily talked for two hours um so thank you very much for joining us and uh explaining all of these complicated uh issues to us and suda i will turn it back to you yeah thanks rachel for moderating today's discussion and marcia for taking the time to tell us what's going on in the u.s uh we hope all of you will tune in next
next time. Um, and thanks again for our supporters for the work that we do. Next uh, month, uh, my colleague Elizabeth, who's been the mastermind of this series, will be sending out um, uh, an invitation for the seventh edition of the Transatlantic Tuesday. So for all of you, good out, you know, have, enjoy your afternoon, enjoy the rest of your morning, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.